Uh, I'm one of the people helping to run this conference, so I wrote these slides last week, promptly forgot about them, helped run the conference, and then I realised I actually had to present them, so we'll get to see the slides together, you and I. So uh, this, this is physics and other meaningless tweaks a user will love. I'm Tim Nugent, like it says on the, the slide. You can see my website there. It's mostly me ranting about Jumanji, so take it, take, what, take it what you will. So physics and other meaningless tweaks a users will love. Now, there is a caveat here. The user love is not actually guaranteed. I can't actually guarantee it. Um, so who am I? I always like to start with a bit of an introduction. So in the bio uh, field, when they were asking for speakers, I wrote, you know who I am, as a joke, and thought they'd pick me up on it. They didn't. They just printed that. Uh, but I doubt everyone actually knows who I am. Uh, so I'm a PhD student at the University of Tasmania. I'm like this close to finished. Uh, I'm also an author. I've written those two books with a couple of friends writing a book about KSP with the same friends, also writing another book, but I was too lazy to find the slide for that. Uh, I also do a little bit of iOS dev work, mostly uh, with the secret lab guys, hence the reason I'm wearing their shirt. That's Manning using Hackertyper. Uh, and I'm an old school dev world guy. I've been coming to every dev world except the first one, um, and I've spoken at nearly all of them as well. So that's why I think I got away with you know who I am. So, uh, who here actually remembers things before iOS 7? Yes, good, good, good. So, basically, they were called skewer morphs, uh, more or less, is how I like to define before iOS 7. So, does everyone remember this fellow? Yes, Game Center, wood panels, fake felt material. What about Find My Friends? Does everyone remember faux stitch leather? Ah, oh, wasn't faux stitch leather great? Now, here's the thing. They're not actually skew morphs. These, this is a skew morph. Or more particularly, the F and the J key are skew morphs. Or, to get technical, those little tiny ridges on the F and the J key is a skew morph. So a skew morph is a thing that reproduces what the real world required, even though you no longer need it. So you don't actually need ridges on an iPad keyboard because you can't feel them but your brain was used to them being there when you looked at it, so it was a good idea to have it. That was the basic idea behind skew morphs. And it sort of got to the stage where people were going like, should we have faux leather or should we have nothing? Should we have the void? Which is better, you know? And the thing is, uh, you know, faux leather, it was everywhere and people hated it. Um, and people latched onto the term skew morphic design. They're like, we hate skew morphic design. It's terrible, it's the worst thing ever. It's, oh, it's awful. But here's the thing, people are stupid. Uh, and they're actually completely wrong. Skew morphs are way better than flat design, which what followed. And there's studies to back this up, and we can talk about them later if you want. But, you know, we don't, we don't want to get into that too much. So skew morphic UIs are better. We can show this through user testing. It is better. People are stupid. So why did Apple change? Why did they abandon this skew morphic design? Why did they go, hey, this is, this is terrible? Well, I mean, I'm not Apple. Is anyone here Apple? No, I didn't think so. So I'd say, if you were, could you tell us why? Uh, the first theory is that people wanted bad UI. Uh, and this is kind of true. I mean, this happens all the time. Same reason why we have these gigantic phones that you need fingers that are like 16 inches long to reach. Because people say, wow, I want a big phone. Not that it's useful, they just want a big phone. Uh, so people wanted it. Apple wants to make money, so they're going to sell the things that people want. So they, they ditch their years of hard work making faux stitch leather and skewer morphs, and uh, instead they made flat UI. And to be honest, Apple did overdo the faux leather. Uh, it was everywhere. Uh, to the degree that it was actually annoying. Uh, it was actually getting on people's nerves. And it wasn't skeuomorphic. Skeuomorphism was squished under the bus of Apple loving fake leather too much. So the other reason why I think Apple moved is, this is maybe a bit uh, controversial here, is a flat UI is a lot easier to make a good UI very quickly and you'll make a similar UI very quickly. Like, if I make a very simple app using the default iOS controls, and you make a very similar app using default iOS controls, it'll look pretty similar to the guy who spent ages customizing the hell out of it, because flat design encourages things to look the same. Skeuomorphic design doesn't. It encourages things to look like what they're meant to be in the real world. So you end up with this very sort of different between the good apps and the great apps sort of approach. So flat design gives everyone sort of an OK level of flat design. Yeah, again, kind of theory, but I think that makes sense. By flattening the sort of the quality market, essentially Apple gets more devs, more devs equals more money. And if, at the very least, even if they sell no apps, 
each one of us who buys an Apple developer license is 100 bucks a year to Apple. So, I mean, just being a cynic, that makes sense to do it. They get 100 bucks a year from everyone. Nonetheless, we ended up with crappy flat design. Uh, and we ended up with crappy apps. So, now, this is a bit mean because most apps still actually do exactly what they always could do or do it better than what they did before iOS 7 came out. But the UI is worse. And the UI is such a big part of an app, I'd say that the apps are probably worse than they were before iOS 7. Even if you know, they might be more performant or actually have slightly better user and interface flow, they're still worse apps overall. Now, not everyone sticks with this. Um, some people try and break the, the trends and they make their own UIs. Now, uh, some people are sticking to the skew more, what a you know, fake skeuomorphic approach of like fake leather and stitching materials and that. That's pretty rare because it looks really out of place. It looks very, very strange. So what I'm going to talk a little bit here is playful interaction. Um, it's kind of a very overloaded term, so I won't go too much into it. And I'm going to sort of talk about how you can use playful interact interaction to not make crappy apps, or at least make your UI slightly less crappy. Uh, so what is playful interaction? Uh, well, like I said, it's very complicated, very heavily interweaven into a whole bunch of different terms and knowledge. It's basically the idea of making your UI fun. So the idea is if your UI is enjoyable to use, people want to use your apps more, ergo they'll get a better experience out of it. That's the entire idea. There's nothing more to it. And it primarily comes from games, because most games have a very fun feeling to them. So the idea is, well, if we can copy some of the bits of games, put it into our UI, maybe that'll work. Now, gamification does not equal playful. They're quite different. Um, I just want to make that very clear, because when people tend to talk about them, they tend to talk about them the same approach. And generally, gamification goes hand in hand with playful, but it's not the same thing. A general sort of difference here is games have rules, and gamification will have rules. UI does not have rules, other than like when you click a button, something happens. Uh, UI doesn't have rules. UI doesn't have gameplay. Games have gameplay. Games have rules. With that said, most playful interactions are game-inspired. Why? Because games are fun. Uh, and playful interaction also works in games, and some of the better games will also have UI that is really nice to use and fun to use. Like it has little things that are nice to click and move around. Uh, because it makes the game more fun. And I'd argue more applications, particularly games, should be trying to use playful interaction inside their UI. But it's a different issue. And the other thing is, it does go hand in hand with gamification. If you want to have a gamified app, for whatever reason that you're doing it, it can make a non-game feel slightly more gamish, which then links very well into your gamification elements of your game. I'm not going to get into gamification because I'm not really an expert on it, um, and I've never made an app that uses it. What I am going to talk a little bit now is sort of like a, a love song to Swarm by Foursquare, because I love this app. Swarm does everything right, in my opinion. Uh, who here has actually used Swarm, just out of interest? Are you talking about the version 3? Well, no, the current version's good, too. Um, so, Swarm, if you don't know, is... Um, does everyone here know Foursquare, I should ask, first of all? So, Foursquare was the location check-in app from, that was huge a couple of years ago. So, it split off into two separate apps. Foursquare, which is now a recommendation engine, sort of like Yelp, and Swarm, which is a check-in engine. So the idea is you check in with Swarm, friends can see what you're doing, etc. And then you look up the restaurant review on Foursquare. That's the idea. And they tie together with each other. Uh, so it's a checking app. And it is pretty heavily gamified. But the thing it really does well is it does playful interaction well. By far the best example I've ever seen uh, in anything, not just in iOS, in anything. Um, so the first thing it does really well is it has physics-based elements. Uh, now, you don't necessarily need to use physics to make your, your things playful, but it does solve a lot of problems because it immediately feels natural. So if you, if you know, like everyone knows how to kick a ball. Even if they suck at kicking a ball, they know how to kick it. Same with physics. If it feels like it moves properly, you feel like you know how to use it. So this is me just taking a, a video capture of Swarm earlier today. And then I'm like, yep, moving it around. So I'm like, imagine I've got a giant finger on the projector there. And yeah, it moves around. The biggest disadvantage with Swarm is the fact that it has ads everywhere. Um, and I wish I'd get rid of them. But the ads are fun to get rid of. Because they've got physics. You're like, and then it falls down. You're like, oh, so nice. And they cascade into each other. Then they all fall down. 
Now, Tweetbot has something similar. If you've ever used Tweetbot, you can flick away the images. Tweetbots is pretty good. Swarms laughs all over it. Completely laughs all over it. It's not even a challenge. Tweetbots is very straightforward. It's just a flick. Swarm has gravity. Swarm has collision. Swarm has all this extra stuff on top that makes it feel nicer, it makes it more playful. Swarm has lots of little tiny animations, little things that don't necessarily add any usability to the product, but they make it feel playful, fun to, fun to uh, play around with. So uh, the, the, it has a gamified element. So apparently, I'm coming third out of 16 friends. So there I am. I can see Zach's below me and Paris is above me uh, in coins, which is their arbitrary currency for checking. I don't really care about the game, gamification side of it. It's not really important to me. Uh, but whenever you get it, you may have seen on the previous video, when you checked in, coins fell down. Now, they don't need to do that. That doesn't help in any way. But it feels nice. It feels playful. It's actually something deliberately from old school games like Sonic the Hedgehog, when you pick a ring, go ping, and then fall down. I reckon the only reason they don't have the noise in is because it probably was too annoying, because it did get annoying in Sonic even. So. But it does other nice little things. So if you look uh, down in the, what's that? That's the bottom right corner there, where it shows my 38 coins. They spin around, so I'll just, whoops, yeah. They actually rotate. I should have made that animation a little bit longer. They actually spin around. And that is a really nice, playful thing. It looks really nice. It encourages you to remember the coins are there. And it didn't require any. It just requires a simple animation to spin around. Of course, it required someone to draw that animation. But you know, it's a big app made by big people. And it has so many other tiny little moments, little things that I don't think most people know in there. I don't even know if like most of the like the power users of Swarm probably know in there. One of my favorite things is they've got a thing called Memory Lane. So when they ported the when they split the application from uh, four, uh, from Foursquare and Swarm, they took all of your trophies and they put them inside Memory Lane and they covered them in a layer of dust. And then if you want to see your trophies, you actually have to scrub away the dust first. Because you know they they want you to be able to get to them, and they want you to remember that you know I used to be an oversharer and a superstar and a shutter bug. I, I never cared about the gamification elements, so I don't even know what these mean. Um, but it's nice that I can go back through and see them again if I did care. And they've made it fun. They've made it fun to find them. To actually find them, it's at the bottom of a table view. You have to scroll to the bottom. Then there's a huge, long, spidery web-like path thing that you have to scroll, keeping your finger on. So if you release it, it snaps all the way back down. You actually have to play like a tiny little game to get to memory lane. Then you tap this little door. It opens. I see units doing it there. Tap the little door. <sighs> yep. Uh, and yeah, there's memory lane. And they also had a trophy cruncher, um, which I couldn't get a screenshot of because I, I didn't think about it at the time. When they introduce a new trophy that is the swarmified version of the Foursquare one, you can throw your old trophy into it, and it gets crunched up with this little animation and spits out the new trophy. And like, that's amazing. Like, it, they could have just had a button for that. And another one that I would have loved to get a video of, but because I don't care about the gamification thing, I never win it. So this is someone else's screenshot I found. If you win the most number of coins, I think it's in a week. I actually don't know. It might be a month or something. A little piñata comes down and swings in front of you. And you have to tap it. And it breaks open and it gives you more useless coins. I'm assuming the coins are going to be used for something at some stage. Like, I don't know what. Maybe you'll be able to buy ads or something. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. But it's really fun. So like, uh, like I was playing it with some friends in Paris 1. And he, the piñata drops down. And it's swinging inside. And so I'm like, ah, oh, watching it swing. And tap it. Tap it again, tap a third time, breaks open, and hundreds of these coins fall out. Like, wow, that is so cool. And again, they could have just made a button. They could have just went, congratulations, Tim. You won this week. Here's your 150 coins. But they didn't do that. They made a little piñata that actually swings according to physics properly, and it makes it You actually tap it, and you, know, you break it open and get your stuff out. And that's essentially could be like, I, I would say, if you're going to take anything away from this talk, take away the, they could have just made it a button. Anytime you're going, well, I could just make that a button, go, eh, maybe I can make it cool in a button. The other thing uh, Swarm does, which I think to make the application more playful, uh, is it has jokes and trivia. And this one's actually really tricky. Um, you could very easily write people off if you write bad jokes. You could very easily annoy people. Um, they take a pretty mild approach to like a Garfield level of comedy. So like, you're like, yeah, I hate Mondays as well. You know, it, it's sort of like everyone can get a light sort of little chuckle out of it without 
being necessarily offended. Uh, so if at least you don't find it funny, it's not offensive. So they have things like this, and these are those little pop-ups again, where it's, you know, fun fact, banging your head against the wall burns 150 calories an hour. Who needs a gym membership? You know, like, no one's going to go do that, but, you know, like, oh, that's great. Or, like, you know, fun fact, typewriter is the longest word you can type with one line. Who knows what that says? Who even cares? Uh, but it's a nice little thing that they add there at the bottom. They give you something else to think about when you're using the app. They're making the app fun. And that's essentially what this whole sort of talk is about, making the app fun. Uh, now, Swarm is the exception. Uh, most app UIs are still crap. Uh, and again, I'm being a little bit harsh here. People put a lot of time and effort into making their UIs flow very well, work very well, be very performant. Uh, but when it comes down to it, they're not as good as their iOS 6 versions were most of the time. Some things are better. Find my friends in Game Center are much better. But most things are worse. Now, deep down inside, I think Apple wants less crappy apps. Or at least I hope they do. Um, I mean, how could they not want le less crappy apps? Uh, so they did actually give us a few little tricks to, to sort of get around this. I'm going to sort of so talk a little bit more about this, and this is where it's going to get a little bit more technical as opposed to the first half, which is a little bit more designy. Uh, and what I want to talk about today is UIKit Dynamics. Uh, so has anyone actually ever used this before, just out of interest, just like throw your hand up? Cool. Has anyone ever used it for more than just like, hey, I wonder what happens if I add gravity to a view? No, I didn't think so. Oh, what? So, oh my god! Some people have. That's actually great. I love that. Um, at its, at its like basic principle, UIKit Dynamics is adding physics and physical-based properties to your UI views. Uh, and there's really nothing more to it than that. Um, Apple actually released a thing which they called the Dynamics Catalog, which basically gives you an overview of everything you do. So they make like pendulums, they make springs, they make all sorts of stuff, and you can you know, essentially see their code, see how they do it. Uh, so I'm going to sort of walk you through it, and then we're going to try and do a live demo, because everyone loves live demos, because they always work. Uh, so you start with dynamic items, uh, and these are represented by a UI dynamic item class, and effectively that's just a UI view. Um, it can technically be anything a little bit more complicated than that, but most of the time you're going to be dealing with views, so a UI view. You then have these things called UI behaviors, which are the behaviors you want to represent. So they could be something like gravity. There's a gravity behavior, which pulls things down at 9.8 meters per second squared, or the iPhone equivalent, so it looks like gravity. There's you know, attachment uh, behaviors, so things connect to each other as if there's some sort of invisible rope. There are push behaviors, so it feels like someone gave it a kick. You know, certain sort of physics behaviors that you're probably used to if you've ever used a physics engine at all. Um, and so what you do is you essentially add these items to the behaviors. So you, you add these views to the behaviors. You say, hey, behavior, I want to you know, look after this item. And then you add all of these behaviors to a UI dynamic animator, which is a fancy word for saying physics engine. Because um, Apple just... Ugh, Needs to be more hipster. Um, and yeah, and essentially it takes care of the rest. You just write the bits up and then go, hey, dynamic animator, take care of it. Um, my biggest complaint with the dynamic animator is you can't really get any information as to what it's doing. It has a delegate, but all the delegate can do is like stop and start. So if you want to make like a physics based game, use a proper physics engine. Don't use UI dynamics. If you want to make a better pop up window, use UI dynamics. Oh, sorry, UI kit dynamics. Um, okay, so let's try this now. We're going to be gutsy. Every time I've done a live demo of Xcode uh, at, at DevWorld using Xcode, it's failed at least once, so this will be fun. Uh, so this will be using Xcode 6 and what are we up to? Swift 1.2, I believe? I never remember the numbers, so no Swift 2 here. Right, okay, so that's Keynote, Tim. That's my cheat sheet. Can you guys... Oh, no, there we go. Cool. Yeah. So I've got my cheat sheet open. So what we have here is a pretty simple thing. I've just got a, a square. I've colored it blue so we can see it. And we're essentially going to make a crude, I'm going to call it tweet bot, tweet bot like, so it's not going to be as good as swarms, flick to get away. So we're not going to have gravity, we're not going to have collisions, we're just going to make a flick away. Hopefully I've got time to do that. So, all right, first things first, uh, I haven't actually attached this to anything yet. Uh, so let's actually do that first. I should have probably didn't, did this one before, so I'll just, let's call you the box like so, and then we're now finished with our UI. Uh, we don't need to touch the storyboard at all. Sorry if that was a bit complex, but uh, it needed to be done. And 
it's weird looking at this one. Okay, so we're going to need a few different things here uh, to actually do this. We're going to need a couple of behaviors, and we're going to need a dynamic animator, which is our physics engine. So first things first, let's actually create the, uh, the animator here. So uh, let's call it animator, so it's the same as my notes. And it is going to be a UI dynamic animator, and I'm going to make it optional because you know it might not actually exist, depending if the view didn't load, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just in case. Uh, and then we're going to need two different behaviors. And we're going to need an attachment behavior, which is essentially going to connect our finger when we move it around to the, the box. And we're going to need a push behavior, which will give it a kick once we, le once we let go of the, um, the box itself. So um, I'll add them in now. So we'll call it attachment. And it is going to be of UI attachment behavior, also optional. And then finally, we'll call it push. Uh, although the term's a little overloaded, who cares? UI push behavior. Right, so these are our three, three ones. Um, again, attachment essentially connects it to our finger. Push gives it a kick. So uh, inside our view did load, we just have to tell our animator what it's looking for. Uh, so in this case, self.animator uh, is going to be equal to a UI dynamic animator. And it needs a reference view or a collection view. I have never been game enough to try using physics on a collection view. Collection views are kind of scary enough on their own, maybe one day. Um, but for now, I'll just add it to the main view itself. Cool, so we now have our animator set up. So uh, that's pretty much all we need to do for setup. What we now actually need is we need the, uh, we're going to have to put in a pan gesture recognizer to actually handle that. So I'm just going to quickly jump back into the storyboard. I'm going to search for a gesture. We want a pan gesture recognizer. I'm going to add it to the main view. And I'm just going to quickly hook it up to an action. Oh, I assume everyone knows how to use Xcode. I probably should have said base level here is I assume you know Xcode. You've done a bit of iOS stuff, um, but you've never necessarily done this. Is this all coming up all right on the projector, or do you want me to make the text bigger? It's all right? OK, cool. Um, oh. It's, uh, Notifications, how do we turn them off again? Scroll down, is it? Well, up, ah. Why didn't that do do not, this? There's, a, there's a thing connected. OK, so we'll call this pan about, like so. All right, so now our UI is actually done, unlike before where I lied. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to do a whole bunch of things. Um, in a nutshell, we're just going to have to do a little bit of sort of physics stuff to actually handle this. And I'm, someone just tweeted, hello, thank you, Beswick. I turned it off. You're too slow. Um, OK, so let's actually do this. So first thing, I'll just get the gesture out of the uh, object that they passed in. Uh, equals, and uh, uh, what is it? It's as with name. I never remember whether it's an exclamation mark or not. I must admit, I should know that in Swift by now. So we're just getting the gesture recognizer out. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to just get a couple of locations. We're going to get the location of the gesture in the super view. And the location of the gest of the jester. Whoa, that'd be cool. The gesture in our little box. So we'll go uh, let location equals jester. Jester. I'm going to call it jester now. Uh, location in view, uh, and we just want our self dot view here, and then we want our. So we'll call it box uh, box location. Sure, box location. Uh, doesn't really matter what we call it is going to be equal to our gesture. I said it correctly that time. Location view, and this one, we want it to be uh, self dot. We call it box, didn't we? The box, the box. I never remember what I named my variables, because for some reason, I never named them the same as my cheat sheet, for whatever reason. I just roll that way. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do now is we're just going to switch across the different states of um, the, the gesture recognizer. Uh, the three states we care about is start, and, and default, um, or sorry, it's began, isn't it? So we'll just create a new switch here. We're going to switch over gesture.state, uh, and then I'm going to do it like so. And then our first case is going to be on dot began, like so. OK. Um, it's my, what are you complaining about there? Oh, because I haven't actually put anything in there, and it's not. Well, what's the term? Swift needs to be fully, your switches need to be fully complete or whatever? Yes. So of course it's complaining. We'll worry about that in a second. Uh, so th first thing we're going to do is we're actually just going to remove all behaviors 
um, because we don't want a previous behavior mucking up and getting in the way of our, our um, object as we're flicking it around. Next thing is we can actually have to get an offset so we know where we are relative to what we're actually grabbing. That's going to be a little bit, I might actually just copy and paste that one to save typing time. I'll explain it in a second. Ta-da! Change that to the box and the box. I used an image in my original one, so it's box location. Because it looked nice actually moving a box around. All right, so what we're doing here is we're just getting the offset of the image relative to the gesture. Essentially, we're just getting where, where our finger is inside it. So we know where it's so, let's say, if we've got that big square, if we grab it in the center, it should move around the center. If we grab it at the corner, it should be pulled around by the corner. Uh, is essentially what we're doing here. Uh, a little bit of you know, maths there to actually work it out. So now we're actually going to create our attachment in here. So our, our attachment is going to be equal to a UI attachment behavior. And we want this to be, which one do we want? We want. Ooh. Pull that down so I can see my notes. We want, oh, good typing, Tim. UI attachment behavior. We want that one. So first of all, we want the dynamic item that we're actually passing in. In this case, it is going to be our, what do we call it? The box. I don't know why I keep going, the box. Um, <laughs> have to forgive me, been working on the quiz instead of my slides because I'm irresponsible. Um, so the offset from center is going to be the offset that we actually created just before. Uh, and it's going to be attached to the anchor location of the location that we've got the gesture of. So it follows the, the finger around. Is essentially the idea. Uh, and then I'll just scroll up a little bit so we can get a bit more space there. Is that, that still looks all right from here, but uh, just... Do you need that bigger or is that read it legible? It's legible? All right, cool. It looks fine here. Um, so, uh, all we've got to do now is we've got to add it to the animator. I'm being really lazy with my Swift optionals because, hey, I know it's there. Um, eh, don't do that in your actual code. Hey, it's a demo. Um, like so. Uh, lazy optionaling there. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, it's a demo. So, this is what happens when case began. Essentially, all we're doing is we're determining where the users put their, their, their meat goo on the, onto the screen and where it's going to anchor the device to. Then we're telling the dynamic animator, hey, I want you to take care of this from now on. That's essentially all we're doing. So that's the first case. Uh, the second case we need to worry about is going to be case ended. Yes, I can remember how to spell, like so. And this is what happens once the user has taken their finger off the end. Uh, so we're going to have to do a few different things here. First thing we're going to want to do is we're going to remove the attachment. Uh, behavior because if we leave that on there, it's still going to move around after you've let go. It's going to be pinned to the view. It's going to be really weird. Uh, so let's just get rid of that first of all. So self dot animator. Uh, so we want to remove behave, not remove all behaviors because we might want some of them. We need to remove the behavior that is the attachment, like so. So we, it no longer is going to be stuck to our finger. Is essentially the idea there. Now we're going to need to get the velocity of uh, the user's flick. Because if we were to set the velocity manually, it would feel weird if you go pew, and then it goes. But if you do go, you should go. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically, you want the velocity to be pretty similar to what the user's actually flicking at, or else it'll feel weird. People are strange beings. They like things to be the way they like them to be. Uh, so we're going to get the velocity here. Uh, I'm going to call it velocity, because that's a great name. Gesture dot, hey, I said the right word this time, but I can't type. Velocity in view, and then we're just going to want to ask, hey, how fast are they actually flicking their finger about, is essentially the idea. Uh, we then need to get the magnitude out of it, which again is going to need a little bit of maths. Uh, but the idea is basically we just need to know how much force we're going to give the flick relative to the velocity. Uh, so I'm just going to copy that one again to save a little bit of time. And it doesn't matter if you don't necessarily know what all this means. Basically, we're just calculating the magnitude. Also, I hate the way Swift handles CG float and float. Ugh. I know why it does it, but I don't have to like it. OK, so now we've got the, the, um, the numbers ready. Now all we need to do is actually hook it in. Uh, so let's grab our, our push property here. Actually, I should call it self.push, because that's my old school brain not letting me like that otherwise. And we're going to make a new UI 
push behavior, and we're going to give it some items, uh, and we're going to give it a push behavior mode. Uh, and that is either instantaneous or relative, I think. Uh, we're going to use instantaneous in this case. This is actually a, um, an array. You can give it heaps of things to flick around. Uh, we only want to flick one. Uh, so we'll just create a new one with the box inside it. And we're going to use... Why is that not completing? Of course it's not completing. Instantaneous. Right, OK. So essentially, we're going to give it a big kick immediately. We're not going to want it to like accelerate, ramp up, or down anything like that. Just pew, fire it out there. We'll let it worry about it. OK, so uh, we've now got that set up. We need to actually give it a direction and a magnitude. Uh, so let's do that now. Self dot, the, not the box. Self dot push. Uh, we want to set its push direction um, to be equal to a new CG vector. Uh, Wait, Swift, I don't need to use the old form anymore, do I? Uh, so in this case, we're going to want... Wait, are they floats? or oh, It doesn't matter. I think they're floats. Um, so velocity, so we want the x of the velocity and also the y of the velocity. So this is essentially... We're giving it an, a, a, a way to point. And basically, that's attached to where we flicked it from before. Um, Right, that looks correct. So we've given it a direction. We now need to give it a magnitude. So that's the last push dot magnitude. Uh, and we're going to make that equal to magnitude. This we might have to tweak. Uh, depending on how hard we flick it, it might move too fast or too slow. You, know, you, you, you can fudge these numbers a little bit. And the better apps will spend a little bit of time tweaking it, making sure. Um, OK, so last thing we need to do there is then add it to the animator just like before, add behavior, so we're going to add our uh, push, like so. OK, and then last thing, we just need a default. Uh, and you know what, we don't need to do anything. Um, I, apart from follow correct coding, yes. But I mean, I thought that was a given. Good, you all, you all found my trick. Very good, very, very good. Uh, so we don't need to do anything in here, uh, you know, what the hell. Who cares? Let's just go, yeah. Uh, that's right, you can put in a break. I keep forgetting Swift has breaks because you never need them. So, yeah. Um, so, we're pretty much done here. Uh, if we, we'll run it in a second, we'll see how it looks. But if you're making this a little bit more intelligently, um, you would have some sort of timeout attached, or maybe you hook an observer up to the view. And essentially, when it gets far enough away or after X amount of time, you would. Um, you know, remove it from the view because we're doing a flick to dismiss sort of thing here. So we'll see how this works now. Do, do, do. We can see if Tim can code. We wait, we wait, we wait. Okay, let's make that a little bit smaller. Oh, oop. <laughs> let's try that again. I think I know what happened there. Oops, that's the wrong one. I ran my demo project. Right. Hmm. Well, it is moving correctly. What have I forgotten here? Sorry? No, I shouldn't need to. Because it's not... It's... it's it's attached to us while we're moving. Oh, wait. You are right. Yes, I made a mistake. We don't actually need to handle the change, but we do need to handle when you're actually moving. I actually forgot to do that. Someone is clever. Yes. Again, you found my clever trap. Ha ha. Good job, Tim. See, I'm a teacher by training, so I mean, I have to throw these balls at you guys to make sure you're catching them. Uh, yeah, exactly. And you are listening. Good job. And you're all paying attention. So basically, we, uh, we, we just need to make sure the anchor point is following the finger. Uh, so what we were actually doing before is we were actually like, essentially we created like an invisible imaginary rubber band that was creating all of this energy. And then as soon as we let it go, it just fired off because, but we never actually got to see it move. It, it was moving in theory. Just The physics was correct. The view was not. Yeah, it's a feature, not a bug. Some people like that. All right, okay, this should now work, he says. Yay, and then, woo, oh. Okay, one last thing really quickly. 
Uh, the magnitude is way too fast. Let's just cut that down by mm, 50. That's 25, Tim. <laughs> what? Ah, 50.f or 50.0. Sorry? All right. Oh, yes. Point. Oh, okay, so. Do, do, do. Yay! So it actually worked just for a change. So basically, that's it. Uh, talks. We, did we run a little bit over time? I think we did. A little bit. Um, so I'll just say thanks. There's obligatory anvil. That's the best way to, to contact me. Um, thanks for coming along. I hope you got something out of it. Try using UI kit dynamics in your apps. Try making your apps more fun. Try making your apps less crap is the more important bit. Thank you.